Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of the Wrestling Underground Podcast. I am your host, as always, Chad Porto. Joining me is the glorious one of himself, Marcus Green. Marcus, how are you? Good, man. I was looking forward to this one, mostly because I'm a fan of both you and uh, your favorite wrestler, and I was looking forward to you going off on a uh, a good Chad rant, because this is... Uh, Kicking off the week with the end of an era, truly. So, yeah, uh, Sting has officially called it quits. Nearly seventeen thousand in attendance. Uh, first and probably only pay per view I've actually ordered from AEW. I'll tell you what the uh, the process to get get it ordered was a nightmare. <laughs> um, I was just about to start streaming it illegally. Actually, I did start streaming it illegally. Uh, when I finally got the opportunity to purchase it right before the uh, international championship, not really excited about paying fifty bucks for a full pay per view, <laughs> and I missed almost an hour of it. But eh, worse things in life. Uh, didn't see the pre-show. Uh, the, the Bang Bang Scissor Gang defeated Jeff Jarrett, Satnam Singh, Jay, Jay Lethal, Willie Mack, and Private Party. Uh, I didn't realize that that was a, a, a group. Willie Max a heel? Willie Max on pay-per-view? <laughs> okay. Just seeing Jay White on the pre-show, though, is, is disheartening. Truly is. Just yeah, not great. Uh, Statlander and Will Nightingale defeated Julia Hart in the sky blue. Uh, all right. So... That's what it was. Um, Sting retires, flanked by his sons dressed as older versions of him. Spitting images, too. Um, honestly, the Sting match was marvelous. It, it's easily going to be one of our match of the year contenders. And apparently we may have figured out what Sting actually wanted to do for his retirement match, but we'll get there at the end of this. Um, just kind of a long story short, this was a, a chaotic car crash that was wonderful to watch. Um, his sons got involved. Darby Allen had the spot of the year going ass over tea kettle through. I, I hope it was sugar last because it, it, it exploded, but it still ripped up his back, something fierce. Um, Sting... Retired, what was it, 30 now? In AEW? Which is perfect. I mean, literally and figuratively. It's just, just a perfect situation to see. Um, and as a champion. Yeah, retains uh, the tag team titles. Uh, I don't know what they're going to do with the tag team belts next. It doesn't matter. Um, but honestly, I think it's time to admit that of the quote-unquote four pillars... Really, only two of them, MJF and Darby, uh, really amounted to anything. You know, Jack Perry and Sammy Guevara are head cases. So I think it's time that we put Darby in the main events in because he's more than earned it. And considering, <laughs> I know how this is going to sound, he's carried Sting in a lot of ways. I mean, the man is 64. There's only so much he can physically do. So Darby did carry a lot of that. Um, but Darby made himself a star tagging with Sting, that's for sure. Uh, I still love the the one gif, and I, I think I retweeted it two or three times yesterday or the, or the day before, of, I think it's one of the guns running up to attack Sting, and then Darby just flies out like a bulldog and tackles him. <laughs> it was fantastic. Um, hell of a match. Hell of a send-off. The best retirement match I've ever seen. Um... Truly spectacular, and as little as much as I dislike the Young Bucks, for them to willingly put over Sting without causing a fuss that we're aware of was fantastic. That being said, the original plan could have been their partner, Kenny Omega. Apparently Sting really wanted to have a one-on-one with Kenny Omega, which would have been fantastic even at 64, because Kenny Omega, despite the fact he's not the guy he once was, say, five, six years ago before AEW was founded, uh, still dynamically better than most guys and could have carried Sting to a fantastic match. Not at all upset, though, about how things went. Marcus, thoughts on the main event, the finale and Sting's retirement? I thought it was brilliant. 
you know, we there's a lot to, you know, uh, fairly criticize AEW for. Um, but they they did right by the OG. You know, we talked about it. We had a three year run, and we said it several times on here. Sting for the last three years has been, was, and probably will be the best book legend that we've seen. Certainly in recent memory, you know, they, they, you know, he was coming off of a potentially career ending, uh, injury. Um, there's some unfortunate events that, uh, was going to tie him off on a sour note on, on his career, but he came in AEW. They set him up very nicely. Three year run with, with Darby by his side doing as much to elevate uh, Darby as it did to maintain Sting and all his stingliness and him going above and beyond giving nothing less than 100% when he didn't have to, you know. Um, I dare say he was down there trying to meet the kids sometimes when it came to jumping off stuff, but he did it. It was great, and, and I think I was telling, going back and forth with Swish on uh, X, saying that his three-year run was basically a best-of highlight reel um, that he delivered to us, and it all culminated in that great climax at, at Revolution when he, he literally took us back in time. Uh, the only thing that was better than the match in his entrance was the theater video that they played beforehand. Um, they left nothing to chance. They, they, you know, that's how you send somebody out. That's how you show respect, you know, from, like, just the, the overall vibe of the show. I mean, the show was built around him. It ended with him. You know, like I said, that video was brilliant. Um, what he did, like I said, the sons, that that was just phenomenal. I don't know. That was, had to be the literal cherry on top of the whole situation with the sons. Um, steamboat out there. Flair, thankfully, nothing happened with Flair. Um, but, yeah, it was brilliant. It was brilliant, obviously. His last two tenures, obviously, you know, we uh, finally talked about his time in TNA, but the WWE run was less than enjoyable. But this felt like it was the, the culmination of a career. And that you, like I said, you got to tip your hat to AEW. They did it right every facet of the uh, of the concept. So you know, hell of a hell of an end to a hell of a career. When you, th- when you think about all the guys that he faced and beat. It's really remarkable. Now, he didn't pin all these guys, but starting with his debut at Revolution 2021, or his debut in the ring, he defeated Brian Cage and Ricky Starks, Ethan Page and Scorpio Sky at Double or Nothing. Uh, He defeated 2.0 on Dynamite. He defeated FTR at Grand Slam. He defeated the uh, Gun Club on Dynamite. Cash Wheeler, Dax, and MJF at uh, Holiday Bash while teaming with Darby and CM Punk. Uh, then you had uh, the acclaimed AHFO, which is Andrade El Idolo, Isaiah Cassidy, and Matt Hardy. Uh, AFO, which is Isaiah Cassidy, Mark Quinn, The Blade, and The Butcher. Uh, then he defeated Bullet Club's Phantasmo and the Young Bucks, <clears throat> House of Black, uh, Jay Lethal, and Jeff, Hart, uh, Jeff Jarrett. Uh, he defeated Kip Sabian, the Mongol Embassy. Uh, he defeated Chris Jericho and Sammy Guevara and Minoru Suzuki, uh, Swerve Strickland, Jay White, Luchasaurus, uh, let's see, Christian Cage, again, The Outrunners, Lance Archer and The Righteous, The uh, Patriarchy, which is just a great name, uh, the Don Callis, I mean, with uh, Kensuke Tishikata and uh, Powerhouse Hobbs, he also defeated Ricky Starks and built Big Bill, uh, Anthony Henry and J.D. Drake, and that doesn't even mention the fact that he took on Akira Hakushi and uh, Naomi Murafuji out of Noah for the Great Buddha's final bye-bye. Uh, and then, of course, he defeated uh, Minoru Suzuki. That was for the... Uh, we already mentioned that one. Uh, he also defeated... Uh, nope, we already mentioned that too. When you just think of the names he beat, like, who didn't he beat? Kenny Omega. Maybe. I think that's it. I think that's the only name he didn't beat during his AEW run. Um, Cody left real early. Probably would have beaten Cody eventually, too. So, like, quietly, Sting had a wonderful run. 
in AEW, which his WWE run, even if you just take away the, the career-ending match, or at least the match that we thought was career-ending in 2015, even if you take that away, still bad. <laughs> still a bad run. Uh, Seth Rollins not he, he's Seth Rollins is a great athlete. He's not a great wrestler because he can't elevate guys in the ring with him. Um, Sting lost to him. He lost to uh, Triple H, which was terrible. Lost to uh, beat Big Show, which I think is his own WWE win. And then he spent one, two, three, four, five, basically six full years, give or take, uh, out of the business. Because WWE fucked him over so bad. And like the one thing that I keep thinking to myself is the one concern he had about going to the WWE was, would he be used properly? He was not. And it's sad that the one blemish on his record is one of the most defining characteristics of his career, which was he was never a WWE guy at any point for any reason. And for a year he was. And it's, it's the lone knock on his career. Outside of that, though, perfect run. Wrestled in AEW, Pro Wrestling Noah, New Japan, TNA, AAA, World Wrestling Council, the World Wrestling All-Stars, the NWA, WCW, he wrestled for... Uh, I'm trying to think of promotions he wrestled for that are actually people you would know. The Middle Atlantic Championships, uh, A All Japan Pro Wrestling, Jim Crockett. Dude's done it all. And at 64, I'm not sad that he's done because this dude for nearly 40 years entertained the hell out of everyone. And he did it with panache. And he did it in a way that didn't turn people off of him. And now there's a conversation like how good was Sting historically? Is he better than Undertaker? And yeah, yeah. Why is that a question? Before 2005, Taker wasn't having great matches. Like, like he had the gr uh, great Hell in a Cell match with uh, Brock Lesnar. But before 05, he wasn't, he wasn't doing that. And even in 05, it wasn't that often. A couple times on pay-per-view a year. I think uh, the angle match in 06 kind of... Took a break, and I, I think a lot of the thing with Taker is a lot of people just assume he's having good matches without even asking themselves if, if he actually is. You know, I didn't like his WrestleMania 24 match with Edge. His match with Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania 30 was bad, <laughs> but we don't want to mention that. We don't, and and it's not on him all the way. He had a concussion, but like, I would put Sting's body of work against anything that the Undertaker did, personally. I think he's he's the better wrestler, the better person. <laughs> Sting converted Lux Luger to Christianity. The Undertaker ran with guys who have, you know, Nazi symbols on their arms. I don't know. <laughs> you tell me who's a better person. Historically, Sting is the guy who stood up for for the what's right. Undertaker historically turned the other way, turned the other cheek, let let a lot of bad shit happen. I don't know. For me, it's not a. It's not a difficult decision. If Sting's better than Taker, of course he's better than Taker. Better promo, better wrestler, better athlete. You put Sting in WWE's, uh, what, what is it? Not a star making machine, but if you if you put him in their hype machine, he he, you you talk to him the same way that you would talk about John Cena. Like as as the greatest of all time. I think he is, truthfully. I think as a complete package, talker, athlete, wrestler, personality, charisma, look, greatest of all time. Simply put. It's going to be hard to find someone else who can do all the things he can for as long as he can. Because, like, think about it. Cena's been doing this for maybe 20 years. Half of, of, of Sting's career. And Cena's already burnt out. Like, physically, like... He, He's just not the same anymore. I'm just, I'm just saying, some guys age well, some guys don't, and you need to be able to age well to be the greatest of all time. Stings it. Yes, yeah, it's it's, it's, it's it's very hard to argue. It's not something that I would. Um, it's not lost on me, man. Two things we'll never see again. Uh, 
in the same week. Um, a guy like Sting in the business from both a talent and uh, person perspective. And uh, LeBron setting that record. Mm-hmm. You, you don't see stuff like that, and it's a, it's a reason why you don't. You know, do what Sting did, the level that he did for as long as he did, when he didn't have to do really a lot of it. Um, you know, speaks values. The fact that he probably redeemed a lot of his stuff, certainly the WWE run, uh, mm -hmm. not that it was felt like anything more than a cup of uh, horribly brewed coffee. Um, with his three-year run in AEW, and uh, you know, like I said, you, you, it's hard to send somebody out better than that. I know, you know, I looked at the press conference and or the post-media scrum, and Kyle, I think, was trying to get him to stay, probably maybe until uh, with All In in London. Uh, but Sting was like, "No, nah, I got to kind of got to call it." You know, when you get that feeling, and like you said, what he's what sixty-three. 64. 64, yeah, no, you got to let him, you got to let him call it, you know, and, and, and this is probably, definitely probably didn't want to take some time, too, because I think he just lost his dad, so, recently, so, you know, things are coming to a close, trying to get to that other side of the child, he, he had nothing left to prove, and, uh, yeah, it was just, it was, it was a beautiful thing to see, I think, you know, on, on top of that being, like you said, probably a match of the year, and certainly uh, one of my favorite moments of the year. Uh, I think second match of the year candidate on the same car goes to, uh, to Kesha and, and Osprey. Um, go figure another MOT uh, featuring Will Osprey. But yeah, it's uh, that in, that Sting entrance and 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 Rhea, the homecoming entrance in Austria, uh, Australia. That was uh, two of my favorite moments of the year. Yeah, and we'll have to. Yeah. Uh, Really keep an eye on the uh, Will Osprey to catch of it all because he 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 really went out of his way for that guy. Shit, yeah, that uh, that that sheer drop suplex in on uh, in the corner. <sighs> Jeez. So let's talk about the rest of Revolution real fast. Um, the Christian Cage win over Daniel Garcia was fine. Uh, I, I, Garcia is fine. I, he he strikes me as a real solid undercard guy. He's only twenty five, but like his name, gimmick, look, it just doesn't work long term. Um, ironically, though, he was trained by uh, Braxton Sutter, the Blade. So maybe he'll find his way to TNA. Who knows? That was a fine match. Kingston Brian Danielson was fantastic. Um, I don't know why we're really pushing this Continental Crown Championship, considering one of those belts isn't even <laughs> AEWs. Yeah. But whatever. Uh, Kingston beating Brian was fantastic. What what a solid match that was, especially when you saw the end of it, like the the post match in the locker room when they were getting uh, taped up and. Brian Danielson tells Kingston he belongs, and Kingston's like, that's all I ever wanted to hear. Um, that was fantastic. The All-Star Scramble match was whatever. Wardlow's going to take on um, Samoa Joe for the title. It was fine. I don't know why we couldn't do the Meat Madness match, because I thought the three guys were supposed to be uh, Hobbs, Cage, and Archer, and they're all here. And Wardlow, maybe. I don't I don't remember. Apparently, injuries was the reason why it didn't happen, but yet, here, here they are. Do you know why that was canceled? No, I don't, but I, I like the concept of maybe, like, the big man scramble better. Like, Wardlow, Hobbs, Archer, Cage. Um, maybe somebody else, a big man scramble sounds better. Oh uh, no, that probably that probably was the, the I mean I was more entertained by that than a Christian match, but that's just because you, you just kept you expect chicanery with the Christian stuff. So, uh, but yeah, that's probably the lowest review unanimous review match on the show. So apparently so. Meat Madness match was supposed to involve Miro and Keith Lee. 
Okay, so it wasn't just supposed to be uh, Wardlow and Archer and Cage and Powerhouse. It was supposed to also involve Keith Lee and Miro. That makes more sense. Is, um, do we do have an update on Keith Lee? Come is like he's like have he like in the key to lines of AEW? Yeah, I don't have any. Ah. We'll see what happens with Keith Lee. Strong defeated Cassidy uh, by pinfall. It was solid. Uh, they really played up the angle that Cassidy really is worn out from having all these uh, international championship defenses because he's basically been champion, save for like a week <laughs> uh, for the last year. Uh, uh, yeah, man. I mean, outside of Sting and, and maybe MJF, he is probably the best book person in the company. What one yeah. up. I think it's time he gets a shot at the world title, too. He won it the first time on October 12th, 2022. And then John Moxley won it on September 3rd, 2023. Held it for 17 days. And then Ray Phoenix won it basically by accident because Moxley got hurt, held it for 20 days, and then Cassidy got it again uh, and held it for the last 145 days. So let's do some math. A little, a little, a little some math. Uh, so pretty much for uh, and then so he held it for 471 total days we had 17 for uh, Moxley 20 for Phoenix uh, that's 508 total days so for basically a year and a third a year and four months give or take he's been the continental champion He's been the face of that division. I think it's fair to move on from him. Only, though, if you're moving him up. Move him up. Let him take on Samoa Joe. Let's see what he can do in the main event scene. Because he's not young. He's 40. People forget that. Like Orange Cassidy is 39 years old. He'll be 40 this year. If you're going to do anything with him, it's, now's the time. Uh, the Black Bull Combat Club defeated FTR. It was fine. I, I wasn't too in invested in that one. Not a lot of personalities there. Uh, but Black Bull Combat Club came out wearing LOD pads, which was, you know, that was interesting. Timeless Tony Storm defeated Deanna Parazzo, doing to Parazzo exactly what I thought they would do, basically using her to elevate uh, everyone else and then forgetting about her. And they haven't done the second part yet, but, but I expect them to. Uh, Osprey in a match of the year candidate defeated uh, Kaneshki Takeshita in a star making performance for uh, Takeshita. Uh, he looked fantastic. Osprey looked fantastic. Osprey is clearly their new ace of the company. And I guarantee they're going to be building up to him versus Kenny Omega for the title, probably at Wembley next year. That, that's my bet. Osprey versus Omega at Wembley. Uh, Joe defeated uh, Hangman Page and Swerve for the AW World Title. Page beat up a ref, and then apparently he's taking time off now. What? <laughs> Sometimes this booking makes no sense. Joe retaining, in my opinion, was the right way to go. There is a groundswell for Swerve. Do you think Swerve should have won it here? No, because honestly, they're still ten. I'm, I'm, I'm a champion swerve, but I'm also a great proponent of Joe, and, and, and kudos to them for striking what iron is high. With Joe, he was absolutely on fire, um, killing it with that always TV title, and uh, only made sense to transition him, um, particularly while, like I said, while he's as hot as he is. Um, the whole thing with Swerve and, and Hangman, unfortunately, doesn't still feel like it's over. But I do like the concept of storytelling of. Hangman hey basically just being obsessed with the concept of never, like he wants to be champion again, but he's even more obsessed with never letting it be swerved because of what he did to him. And if you're going to do a storyline where you have one man break into another man's house and threaten his baby in a crib, I appreciate you keeping that same energy long term. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah, you, <laughs> so, don't, you don't forget that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So... I can appreciate that concept though, because the whole thing in the match was um, like Joe caught him in a cook. Well, hell, you saw it. Caught him in a cook in the clutch, and then Swerve may have been inches away from breaking it up. And then the whole concept is did Hangman tap because he was done, or did he tap because 
he didn't want Swerve to have a potential to win. Not gonna appreciate that. Hell of a thing. Yeah. All right, and then of course the main event was Sting and Darby Allen retaining the tag team titles against the Young Bucks. Pretty good show. Pretty good show. We don't do a show of the year, but if we did, so far Revolution would be it. Hell of a yeah, hell of a thing. Um, I'm, I'm still holding. I hope that uh, TNA comes through and pulls out some great stuff. I mean, they they've been consistent, um, but this is this is probably gonna be a hard show to top. Um, but yeah, um, for you, uh, what I guess what we talked about the highlights and lowlights. But did, was there a point in the match where you got like worried? At any point for maybe Sting, I mean, obviously, there's all, all Darby didn't die, that's the thing. Now. So, yeah. And Darby Allen, who did not die. Uh, no, I, I, for me, Sting was one of those guys that uh, I know if he's wrestling, he is confident in what he's doing. He's not recklessly, he's not, you know, fucking. Ric Flair, for crying out loud, you know? Uh, so I, I I didn't have the same trepidation with him wrestling as I would other guys. Maybe that's just me being a fanboy, but yeah, so be it. <laughs> um, all right, anything else from uh, the show you wanted to cover before we move on? I'm going to take that as a no. <laughs> Let's talk sacrifice. Not what Sting and Darby Allen did that her bodies by going to that glass, but the upcoming TNA show that's apparently this weekend. In three days, which I mean, I think it's Friday. It's Friday. Uh, Nick Nemeth will take on Steve Macklin. I do believe this is for the New Japan International Global Championship, whatever it's called. Uh, although it's not listed so on Wikipedia, although I'm pretty sure that it's a title match. Uh, ABC will take on the system for the tag team titles. Alexander, Josh, Alexander will take on Hammerstone, who has officially signed with the company, which is fantastic news. Time Machines, Kevin uh, Knight, Kushida, and Chris Sabin will take on Mustafa, Mustafa Ali, and the Good Hands. Uh, I think Alex Shelley might be dinged up. Uh, Jordan Grace will take on Tasha Steele since I have Brooks in a triple threat match for the Knockouts Championship and the Moose will take on Eric Young for the main event world title match Marcus how do you think Sacrifice is looking so far? I think it's solid um, looking forward to all the matches um, didn't get a chance to ask this last week but going back and fully watching uh, No Surrender I uh, wanted to get your take on do you think that the concept of the no surrender match should be a staple going forward? Yes. Yes. Whether it's at no surrender the event or it's just as another way to get a big time match going, I, I do. What I would like to see them do is really involve themselves with bigger groups, um, bigger stables, and, and whatnot. And then use these stables as ways to build to the no surrender match. Um, I think that's a great concept that I would like to see more out of. But you know, we'll we'll see what they do. Uh, the new regime is settling in. It's very possible we get some real bangers. It's very possible we don't. You know, we we don't exactly know how this new regime is going to go. So time will tell. But I would like to see it become a, a new stable and with Tom Dreamer leading the charge, or is at least among those leading the charge, I think we have a good shot on this being a regular thing, personally. So, we'll see. Uh, Marcus, of the no surrender, of the sacrifice matches, what, which one is standing out to you the most? Uh, probably Hammerstone, uh, Alexander Hammerstone, too, uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, just, I mean, obviously, you can just look at both of those two guys separate on paper and you put them together as magic, and then if you need any more proof, go back and watch their first match. Um, you know, Alexander is, is you know, he's the Iron Man of the, of the company for a reason. He's the guy that you go to. Out, I think I said on the last show, or maybe with somebody else, Alexander is, is quickly is quickly become the Ishii of TNA. Mm-hmm. Um, but you have to go through him if you want to, you know, 
test your metal and certainly if you want to move on to the upper ranks he's he's the guy um that that stands in front of the gate so it's fully expecting a banger from that i'm looking forward to the potentiality of, of some because I, I love a good triple threat so that uh you know brooks and, and tasha Steele's match um is, is sick uh, if for no other reason, the fact in my head I'm picturing the ending of the match because I know we both know she can do it. The picture in the ending of the match being uh, a double muscle buster, mm-hmm. both of them on her shoulder because we know she can do it and they're perfectly sized for it too. So um, I think that'll be sick. Um, and uh, the tag match I think is going to be uh, some solid stuff. Don't know necessarily what to expect from the main event. Um, Although, you know, Eric Young is no slouch, but, you know, we don't necessarily know how that's going to go. So, uh, but I think it's a solid call overall. I would be surprised if Young, uh, if Young took down Moose. I do see the system winning the tag titles here, though. Um, everything else, though, uh, and I think Nick Nemeth is going over because Macklin, I think, is leaving the company, which I'm not sad about <laughs> uh, at all. So and you think he's going to AEW? I don't know. You know, he, he could be, you know. I feel like if he goes to AEW, they're going to do the one thing that doesn't make any sense and actually push him out the gate as opposed to everyone else that they just kind of forget about. Brian Cage is still, he's still part of the roster. You know, if he came back to TNA, who knows? He could actually be a star instead of being a secondary piece to a forgettable story. Yeah, so. yeah it's, it's just interesting because I just feel like he's just primarily the the guy right now in TNA. I understand why they potentially want to branch out. And unfortunately, with, with how everything happened with Scott, you know, I think that I think that set up for a lot of people to kind of second guess or question whether or not they wanted to stay, unfortunately, because of the whole morale thing. But I don't know. I feel like, you know, TNA would probably be a good place for him to continue to hone himself and whatnot because they don't really know him. I mean, outside of what he's done in TNA, he's a literal forgotten son. Um, so, you know, they put him in AEW. Maybe they put him with Deanna and then do a, a months-long couple feud with her, Ty, and Johnny. Um or, you know, they like you said, they immediately push them out the gate, which, again, got to do a lot of work because they're going to have to acclimate them to that audience. And you look at that, that media men off we just talked about, if you're not doing something consistently with Lance Archer, Brian Cage, Wardlow, um, and the other guy, like, I don't, I don't know what you're trying to do with somebody like uh, Macklin. That's no shot at him, but it's like, those guys are at least accustomed to the audience. I say take your shots at Macklin because Macklin's nothing, I think, to write home about. Maybe you put him in a tag team, you could get some use out of them, but I really feel like we've we've gotten the most out of Macklin. And that's how to be in maybe like a heavy for a heel stable. I don't know what else you can do with him. So I'm fine if he leaves. I think there's plenty of opportunities elsewhere, and I, I'm... I'm really just hoping that they're going to build a Moose Hammerstone at Slammiversary and give Hammerstone the win and a long-ass title reign because this dude is phenomenal. And I think fans are going to get a real good look at who he is going going forward. Real quick, though, speaking of media, man, because this guy... uh, was, uh, like I said, against a re-debuting Andrade last night. If should they lose Macklin, would you bring in somebody to reinvent himself like a Uha? Oh, absolutely. Oh, I love Uha. God, I forgot he was there until he came out <laughs> to face Andrade. I'm like, I was immediately fodder, but Jesus. Yeah, I don't know why he's still there. I don't. He's only 36. He's got time. He, uh, they really. F- and I knew they would. They really fucked this dude over. This is someone who could be truly dominating in a different company who knows how to use him. Yeah, it's, uh, it's tragic because he, he debuted in NXT. 
didn't really pick up the momentum. We, we probably should have sent him to the main roster. And then we know <laughs> when I when I sent you that video, the, the 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 situation between him and Big E, what that was. And then they sent him back to NXT, and that didn't really go. So like, when they do that, and you still end up being fodder like this. It's it's like they literally have nothing for him, and it sucks because I remember the fanfare that he had prior to him coming in, and that was coming off of you, mm-hmm. um, and other people, and it's just like that's that's insane. So it'll be cool to see somebody like him if they can get somebody like him, along with a guy that we're gonna talk about coming up uh, in the form of tag team, uh, legendary tag team from the brand. Like they guys like that, I think can move the needle. Should somebody like Macklin move out? So. Yeah, it's crazy to think that Apollo Crews has been there for a decade, and I think it's time that Apollo Crews finds a new pasture. Return to Uha Nation. I think he could be phenomenal, but we'll see what happens there. Uh, Sacrifice this weekend, uh, this Friday. Check it out. I will be. It'll be fun. Um, Speaking of names that could be coming back, uh, Mike Santana. Former member of LAX, Pride and Powerful, Ortiz and Santana, whatever you want to call them, uh, has confirmed he is done with AEW. He is a free agent, uh, and it seems like he's free and clear of some substance issues. Uh, I think it was uh, alcohol he he, uh, admitted to being a bit of a fan of. He's a free agent now. I would love to see Santana back in TNA. He was the one guy that... I really thought that new aid and that new LAX stable could develop into a star. And now that he's free and clear of AEW, I think it's really possible he comes back to TNA and maybe finds that next step. What do you think? Yeah, same. It's unfortunate what happened, whatever the fallout was between him and Ortiz. They should have been able to have a hell of a run in, in the AEW as a tag team, but seems like their greener days uh, ended up being the stuff they did in, in uh, I guess, the Indies and primarily TNA. So um, I'm glad we got them together while while we, you know, they were cool. I don't know if it, that fence going to ever be mended. Like I said, I don't know all the details of the specific fallout. I know Santana got injured and maybe um, that maybe aided in his... his, his uh, closeness with the bottle, if you will, but he's back now. He's 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 yoked, and it looks like he he only cares to you know be somebody that that be taken seriously as a heavyweight contender. So um, if he comes in and he bangs out, bangs with guys like you know Bailey, uh, Gresham, if we could get him back, um, Alexander and others, I think he could, I think he could really kill it. And the history is there. So he's got his one year sobriety chip. Happy for the guy. I would love to see him back in TNA. I think he would make a hell of an addition and a hell of a, a, a name to build around, especially if he can stay clean. Would love to see it. Bailey Alexander, while he's still with us, because he may be gone by the end of the year. Uh, Hammerstone. There's a lot of potential with, uh, with Santana. Lastly, though, we have to talk about the douchebags. Specifically one we, we, we mentioned about a lot, and that's Sammy Guevara. There's few guys in wrestling who deserves fewer opportunities than they get as much as Sammy Guevara. This dude's on, like, Strike 48. And it was announced a few hours ago that he's been suspended by AEW for failing to protect Jeff Hardy and hitting him with a finisher after Hardy was concussed, I do believe due to uh, Guevara's bot shooting star at press. <laughs> so not only did the guy get concussed because of uh, Guevara, Guevara then put him in further harm's way. Now, everyone's like, well, you should blame the referee, and maybe admonish the referee, but this is now two Hardy boys he hurt. Now, we can sit here and say, well, it's because he, he, he continued the match. I, I would have suspended him for, for uh, concussing him in the first place. He's a reckless, unintelligible, 
at times lazy, unmarketable, poorly educated, poor speaker, terrible look, and just all around unlikable human being. He doesn't move the needle. He doesn't sell buy rights. He doesn't move the uh, television uh, uh, figures. He doesn't move merchandise. He's not popular. He's not well liked. He's not respected. His biggest claim to fame is saying he once wanted to rape Sasha Banks. I don't know why he's around. And this is not a new thing. He had issues in TNA. He had issues on, in the Texas Indies. Um, the dude is just a troubled human being who shouldn't be in the wrestling business and shouldn't be on an AEW roster and shouldn't be perpetually given all these opportunities. I think it's time to let him go. Marcus, am I being too unfair? No, and it, 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 it strikes to a conversation we was having before we got on there about the whole concept of the AEW four pillars and looking at what that's it. Now I'm I'm not I'm no a I'm no MJF fan by any stretch, but he has you know proved himself to be a leader of the pack. And obviously we talked about uh, next up is Darby. Obviously the you know the daredevil that we hope can last long enough to get. Uh, to the level of MJF. But these other two, Jack Perry kind of fizzled out, uh, unfortunately, and Guevara seems like he's following suit with his own uh, recklessness. Kid's young, he's got a lot of ability, um, certainly a daredevil, but it's not amounting to the, the, the consistency in, in, in a positive way. You know, obviously, he's a, it just overall between all that stuff that he's had with in ring accidents or what have you, most of which I would hope be un unintentional, of course, and the whole thing with Sasha Banks. He's always come off like a guy who's had a lot of maturing to do, and you would have hoped that obviously somebody like Jericho could have helped got him through that, although at this stage in the game, I don't know how thorough of a uh, learning tree being under Jericho uh, would, would necessarily benefit certain individuals. But it just feels like the kid got a lot of maturing to do. And obviously, he's a new dad. And that tends to mature up most people. But maybe he needs to take some time, reflect, kind of do that that life situation. Uh, let that be his focus and let that kind of do the maturing for him. Maybe step back and come back come back to the game later, you know. But right now, it's just it's not working. Like the hardest, we talked about this before, The hard, both of the hardest at this stage got to have the exact same x-ray that Christian Bale's Batman had, or, or Christian Bale's Bruce Wayne had at the beginning of The Dark Knight Rises. Like, um, so I'll tell you this, sir, you, you have no cartilage. Like where? Anywhere. <laughs> at all. Like you have no cartilage. <sighs> now, you're not wrong, especially with the Hardys. Uh, I think they should be hopping ship. Um, I, I think there's potential for AEW. I, I do. Uh, I think they can really make a, a s asserted effort to get themselves back into positioning. I think the arrival of Okada and Mercedes will dramatically help things. They need to do better with protecting their legends. They need to do better with um, how they promote and how they insert their legends into different scenes. And if you have a guy like Jeff Hardy, who can still go, like, he's not washed by any means. He's not what he once was. But if you have a guy like Hardy, the last thing you want is to put him with somebody like Guevara, who doesn't know how to wrestle, who doesn't know how to protect people, who hurts people. So, hopefully... I, I don't think this dude can learn. Hopefully they move on from him and hopefully they uh, they write the ship, so to speak. That's my opinion. Um, Marcus, any final thoughts on this week's show? Uh, just um, RIP to the legends. I think we lost. I think we lost a couple recently. Mm -hmm. Oli Anderson. RIP. Yeah. Uh, I think I think Virgil, correct? Yep. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So RP to those guys and a happy birthday to our very own TNA knockout champion uh, Jordan Grace, who I think is twenty eight today. Mm-hmm. 
uh, which is insane to think how young she is. Um, so, yeah. Paul Heyman's going oh. to the Hall of Fame, and everyone thinks Tom Dreamer's going to show up to kill him. <laughs> yeah, I saw that because I wasn't an ECW guy. I didn't get the reference, but that's hilarious. Yeah, Tommy Dreamer once said he wants to kill Paul Heyman. Now, that wasn't recent. But he did have a plan to murder Paul Heyman because of all the shenanigans that Paul Heyman put him through. Uh, that's so, that's now, Dr- Dreamer has, has since gone out and uh, thanked or, or congratulated Heyman. Maybe it's a ploy, though. Maybe it's a ploy. <laughs> Maybe it's all a ploy. Mm. Yeah, he planned on killing Tom, uh, Paul Heyman at WrestleMania 17. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wrestling is wild, man. Um, any final thoughts though before we head out? Before we head out. No, man, like you said, watch Sacrifice. Things will be a solid show. It's on a Friday when, when shows like this should happen. <laughs> Not bogging up the weekend, kind of over kicking it off. So, uh, looking forward to that. And, uh, yeah. All right. With that being said, we're done. Uh, be sure to follow Marcus on his personal Twitter account, uh, Paradox Kid, P A R A D O X K I D. That's me. You can also find him on his other podcast, The True Penny Show, T R U E P E N N Y S H O W. You can find me on Twitter at Chad Nerdcorp, C H E D N E R D C O R P. And on the Instagram of Chad's Photo Hut, C H A D S P H O T O H U T. Uh, the website is realnerdcorp.com, uh, and Twitter account is nerdcorp, N-E-R-D-C-O-R-P. Uh, be sure to follow us on YouTube and Twitch when you get the chance. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I think that's it. So, for Marcus Green, I'm Chad Porto. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for checking us out. Thanks for giving us a chance. Remember, as always, to watch more wrestling, and Marcus, take us home.